Hi everyone, this is Sam from the Sound Architect podcast. Just a little note before today's episode, sadly it's not our usual awesome quality as there was a technical problem with Elan's audio. However, huge shout out to our editor on this one, Toy Volcalio, who did an amazing job cleaning it up so that you could listen to it today. And I hope you still enjoy our episode. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Elan Eshkeri and you are listening to the Sound Architect podcast. Hello and welcome to the Sound Architect Podcast. I am your host, Sam Hughes. And as you just heard, I am joined by composer Elan Eshkari. Thanks for joining me today. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Awesome. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm very, very excited to talk about Ghosts of Tsushima. But before we do that, I would love to hear how your journey into music composition began. Uh, Well, I I suppose it goes, uh, goes back to my parents choosing uh, for me to learn violin at the age of four years old. My, my, um, my mum was a very talented pianist and, uh, and I, can, I, I remember have very uh, strong memories of, of being a tiny child and listening to her playing Chopin on the piano. And there was a, there was a combination of, of feelings that felt like stories to me and, and, and colors. I, I have synesthesia, so I have an extremely strong association of, of music and, and color. Oh, that's super interesting. And those things go back right to, to the very beginning. Maybe even I have a very strong affinity to, to recover to, to three particular pieces of Chopin that, um, my mom played while she was pregnant with me. So, um, so I mean, who knows how far back that that kind of stuff goes? But I but I think you know that uh, put music inside of me. And then when I yeah. learned violin, I learned Suzuki method, so I, so I learned by ear, and and that was all uh, that 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 for me I, it was always uh, the the music was always malleable for for me. You know, I used to. My, t- my teacher and, and my mum, when she was helping me learn, that I'd want to change the music and then sort of try and keep me on track. Not change it significantly, but I, you know, I always had a, a strong sense of interpretation of how, how it should be. You know, I got an electric guitar for my 13th birthday and, and, nice. you know, and well, my influences were very varied. I was, you know, I was a very young teenager when NWA exploded onto the scene and that music <laughs> awesome. was, was, you know, well, that was a real movement in music. And then mm. I got an electric guitar. So I was also into Metallica and Iron Maiden. Um, and, and then I, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was 14 or 15 when, when, uh, when I remember hearing Teen Spirit for the first time, and so I was at a good age for the grunge movement, and then the Britpop movement, and then in my early twenties, it was all about it was all about electronic dance music, although we, we didn't call it that in England back then. But um, and so so I had a sort of very varied musical experience. Uh, growing up, but through that, you know, I was in bands and writing songs with with mates and and interested in film music because it seemed like the new form of classical music. Back to the Future was the first album I ever bought, so I had all the, fantastic soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, and I remember listening to it, you know, over and over again. All the cool pop, that you know, it was great because it was the there was the the fifties pop songs, and then there was the eighties pop songs, and then there were two great. Um, Silvestri bits of score on there, and uh, and so all of that was was very inspiring to me. And the idea that all of these things could exist together was was um, Im- important for me. So uh, so I felt able to explore all of these all of these different things, you know. And 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 then the rest of it is you know like like most people's stories, you know I. I did short films and and then I got like a cheap TV show called Young Gifted and Broke, believe it or not. Um, but um, you know, and I wrote the title music for that. And whilst I was doing that, I'd been introduced to a composer called Ed Shermer, who was the protege of Michael Kamen, and I worked for for him and for Michael. Um, and and you know, and 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 then bit by bit, knocking at every door, I, I started to get projects here and there. Until until eventually uh, I got the chance to do the score for Layer Cake, which was my first film of any significance. Amazing. 
And uh, I haven't actually seen Layer Cake, but from the score perspective, what? how did you jump into such a gangster-fueled movie? Well, it was, I think I was 26. I was very young. Uh, and at that point in my career, I, uh, you know, it's it just anything, whatever, whatever I could, whatever I could do. But the score, they'd been doing the score with Lisa Gerrard, the, the incredible singer from Dead Can Dance. Uh, but it, it had become apparent, I think, to, to, to Matt and the production that she was struggling in certain areas and, uh, you know, and absolutely smashing it in others. So they brought me on board. But from watching the film and meeting uh, Matthew Vaughan to uh, the first day of recording in Abbey Road was exactly two weeks. So it was a, it was really intense. I didn't have any time to wow. think about anything. <laughs> But um, but well, yeah, it was brilliant, and uh, you know, and and from that, I made some very very strong friendships. You know that that crew of people, you know, who worked in those sort of sort of renegade British movies at, at the beginning, Lock, Stock, Snatch, yeah. and who worked with Guy and, and Matt. Uh, you know, there's a real um, connection between all of us from the from those early days. Uh, not not just post production, like 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 production actors. You know, we're all, you know, a lot of us are friends and it's, you know, almost feels a bit like being part of some some great, great club and it's always wonderful and our paths cross and we get to work together um, on different things. Yeah, I can imagine, because not long after that, you were on Stardust as well, weren't you? Yeah, well, you know what? It, it Now it feels like it wasn't long after that, but i got to say the, year, the years between uh, say, yeah, and, the time. And Stardust <laughs> were, were like a sort of desert. It was, it was oh, <laughs> man, those, they, those were really, there were some really, really tough times. And uh, like I, I totally ran out of money and I had to... Uh, luckily a friend of mine had gone to LA and he let me stay at his place uh, rent free because I'd totally run out of money and I can remember having this this tiny little project called Tricks and Tips which were like these sort of three minute films to learn how to skateboard or to surf or something and um and I can remember you know you, you wouldn't send audio files uh over email really back then but but you know we we were sending emails, but the, the Wi-Fi in the house wasn't working for some reason. I can't remember why. And I remember sitting outside the pub in the gutter, sitting in the gutter outside the pub down the road early in the morning, hopping onto their Wi-Fi, which wasn't password protected, in order to be able to just get an email so I could do this job that was paying me like two hundred or three hundred quid or something. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, they were. They were really. They were difficult times, but you know. But you know that's part. That's part of the journey, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's the it's the reality again. Like, um, it actually, it's a bit of a tangent, but it reminds me of the the social media image you give to the world, right? And the actual reality of what's going on, because a lot of people will share the the good stuff. Right, living your best life on Instagram, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and no one sees you like crying for the weekend because you don't know how to handle the next month. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I have two questions before we dive straight into Ghost of Tsushima. Um, cause I'm kind of interested. Was the Sims 4 your first video game? Uh, yes. I, I hesitate only because m years before that, okay, going back to the, to, to those difficult years between Layer Cake and Stardust, after Layer Cake, I got asked to work on a video game at PlayStation UK. Uh, and it was all going ahead and I wrote music for a trailer and I made some very, very good friends at PlayStation and, and, and in particular with a, a, a woman who, who's now a, a, a successful director. Um, uh, and uh, But unfortunately, that game, it was a sequel to another game, but that game never saw the light of day. They just stopped making it for some reason or another that was above my pay grade to understand. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I was always, I always had a strong desire to do, to do video games. And, uh, and I was connected to that world. You know, some of the people, uh, who were at PlayStation back then, who I was friends with and we'd go to the pub and have drinks with are now 
very high up the ladder uh, at Sony uh, at Sony PlayStation now, um, and that not not it was not that they had anything to do with me getting the game. In fact, they weren't any part of Ghost of Tsushima um, at all. But uh, but nonetheless, they they knew the people I was working with. It was nice to reconnect with with them. So yes, uh, th- that is a very long-winded way of saying you are right. Sims was my my first uh, computer game. Well, yeah, and then not long after, or well, I say not long again. This is the <laughs> this is the dangerous no, thing. Actually, years, not long, it was not... seven. I've been doing Sims for seven years, so so maybe eight years. When did I start? Wow. Is it two thousand and? Well, I can't remember when I first did Sims 4, but it, it was a long time ago. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'm purely going by the date of the game, which is like 2014, I think. 24, okay, fine. Well, yeah, look, that's... So, yeah, I was right. Seven years ago, I was recording it. Yeah. It came out six years ago. So that that's pretty. that's a pretty big gap. It was a huge gap. But what, what I was also intrigued by is the year before, you did, well, roughly the same time then-ish, you did 47 Ronin. Yes, that was... I I think that might have even come after The Sims, to be honest. I mean, it's funny, yeah. the release dates of things and how... I think it might have come after my, my work with The Sims. Yeah, 47 Ronin. But that's also maybe the closest samurai connection before Ghost of Tsushima as well, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's the only... I mean, I did a ninja film called Ninja Assassin before, but, you know, but the thing is, is that... The, they're, they're very different, right? Because of course, yeah. Forty-seven Ronin, although it's based on a true story uh, and a very famous and culturally important true story, it's taken and put into a complete fantasy context where there are dragons and Kirin beasts and witches and. Um, and so that film was all about Hollywood fantasy epic. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really about uh, uh, about Japanese music and Japanese authenticity. So, uh, where, where, whereas Ghost of Tsushima was all about that, that search for authenticity. And, and so the approach and the feel of those things were very, very different. There was nothing really from 47 Ronin that that uh, informed my work on uh, Ghost. Yeah. And speaking of Ghost of Tsushima, I've been very patient because I'm very excited to talk about it. So I, I've been very patient leading up to it. I'm very, I want to start from the beginning. So Ghost of Tsushima you kind of touched on how you first got involved, right? So you knew people at Sony on the project. Is that how you got involved or? No, that was, I mean, that was really an aside story. The, the people right. that I know at Sony, first of all, I kind of lost touch with them, you know, this yeah. was going back, like, you know, more than a decade. And second of all, they weren't involved in this game at all. Um, right, okay. It was just nice to sort of reconnect because, of course, they knew the people that I was working with. And so we... We, we reconnected as a result, but but uh, but yeah, no, it was nothing to do with that. The, the way I got involved was was um, that PlayStation, uh, the PlayStation music team got in touch with me, and they were interested in a score that I'd written called Coriolanus, which is a Shakespeare play uh, directed by Ray Fiennes. And starring Ray Fiennes, um, and it was Ray Fiennes. It was his directorial debut, and um, it was a very. Ray was quite nervous about music and how music would affect his film, and so and this is repeated in my work with Ray. From and it's one of the reasons I love working with him, is that I I came up with a fairly extreme idea. Um, uh, uh, we would have no reverb at all in any of this music. It would be percussive bass, um, and all of it would be performed live, uh, and it was. Uh, and it was just a very... It, there was, we had a very clear idea of what we wanted to achieve, and we were completely uncompromising about 
achieving it. And I'm always happy and always delighted to work with Rafe because whatever crazy idea I throw at him, uh, he he's happy to explore it to the fullest extent. And he is like me, he wants to be uncompromising in the artistic intention of it. So at the end of it, there's a real sense of having done something really purely artistic. Uh, and with Coriolanus, that, that it was certainly like that. I, I, I encourage you to listen to the score on headphones and, and you'll, you'll hear what I'm talking about. Um, so when PlayStation approached me, I, I was a little reticent because I didn't really want to do, I, you know, I don't like doing violent slashing up actiony things because not, not right. because I've got any big moral position on it. I mean, God knows I've, I've spent many of my teenage years playing Mortal Kombat, but, but, <laughs> but, but just because artistically, creatively, I don't know what I have to offer, you know, emotionally. I don't know how I connect to, to that kind of project. Um, right. So I was a little reticent, but they said, look, we're really interested in this score you did for Coriolanus, which is this niche art house movie in this really unusual and extreme score. And so that intrigued me. I'm like, okay, you're making a blockbuster computer game, but you're interested in this bit of, uh, of niche artwork I made. Fair enough. You've got my interest. Yeah, so, nice. And then we went to Seattle and we went to see the Sucker Punch guys. And the Sucker Punch guys spent 45 minutes walking me through the story with sort of video and pictures and images and and, and just describing the, the whole story of Ghost. And by the end of that, I was totally sold. I was so blown away by by the narrative of, of Ghost. It's such an emotional, powerful story about, well, about all the big, important subject well some of the big important subjects you know because because you know that's that's what makes stories timeless that's why shakespeare is timeless it's always relevant to what we're going through because yeah we we repeat our stories but in sort of modern other versions you know as, as, course, as, yeah. as, as, as a race and ghost is dealing with with a young man who's in emotional he's in emotional crisis or emotional conflict because because in order to save the people and the, and, the, and the home that he loves, he has to go against all the tradition and morality that he has learned from his from his father, father slash uncle, and um, and so that that emotional conflict is a very rich and powerful place to be writing emotions from, and and it's sort of encapsulating this idea of the the new ideas versus the old ideas. Uh, how much do you hold on to, to to the old ideas? How much do you give way to the younger generation and uh, and the new ways of doing things and uh, the, the, you know making societal change? I mean, we're living through through a really strong moment of that right now, aren't we? So yeah, so, exactly. So you know, in the games dealing with these topics, so 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 emotionally. I was really connected to the, to the project, and I thought I've got a I've got a lot to say here. And then on top of that, the the, the sucker punch having this very strong desire to base everything in, in great authenticity. You know, they 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 took leaves from the island of Tsushima so that they could design the leaves and the trees with more uh, authenticity. And, wow. and so I, and so I was so inspired by that as well. And I just really was looking forward to doing the research and basing this music in something really, uh, really authentic. That's crazy cool. Did they kind of give you a brief or did they just walk you through it and go, we want this authentic experience? Yeah, they, they, they said, all right, we need some combat music. We need a theme for this character. We need a theme for that character. And then I'd say, well, all right, what's this character's story? Send me pictures of this character. Send me a little clip of this, the design of this character so that I can engage and be inspired. And then I, and then, yeah, I just sat down and, and wrote the music, but, but actually the first part, the first several months for me was about research, researching Japanese uh, the melody, the scales that they use, uh, the folk songs, the religious music, the monk music, shomyo music, uh, the court music, uh, re researching all of this stuff, and specifically what what are, what's folk music from the island of Tsushima? What kind of music were they listening to at that period of time? Um, yeah. 
and uh, and then what instruments were they using, and and going on that journey, and then and then working with these great masters of Japanese instruments to learn from them how to write in a naturalistic way, and you know in 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 the score there are. There are things that I've written completely myself. There are some things that are based on ancient folk tunes. There's, there's a piece called The Forgotten Song, which is actually a very ancient Shomyo chant that, oh, that, wow. that Japanese monks would have been singing for more than a thousand years, easily. And, and you know, it's performed That's awesome. by this incredible woman, um, Jinko Ueda, and I'll talk a little bit about her. Sorry, I'm not letting you ask many questions. I'm just no, no, no. I'm enjoying this answer. Go ahead. Um, but she sang that song for me, and I was really moved by it. But she sang it just as a vocal, and so then I took the first bit of it and then made an arrangement of it. Um, and I found her because with my research, you know, you know, we started off with the obvious instruments, the koto which is the plucked instrument, the shakuhachi, which is the wind instrument that people associate a lot with Japan. It's very uh, prevalent yeah. all over Japan. Um, and then, but the thing for me was to learn, well, how they play these kinds of pen, these kinds of five note pentatonic scales. Uh, but you know, with the shakuhachi, you can bend up to a note or you can overblow and, and play over a note in, in pitch. Uh, right, okay. With the koto, you can't play under the pitch of a string, but you can bend a string up a semitone or a whole tone. I don't know how nerdy your listeners are in terms of music. Oh, I'm pretty nerdy, but, so this is great but, for me. You so. Know, so, so you start <laughs> to learn, and, and like the bottom, the lowest notes of the uh, koto were tuned, the fifth apart. So, so I started to really learn how to write for these instruments. I mean... I'm no expert, obviously. I, now I, a little knowledge is dangerous, right? I know just enough to know how yeah. much I don't know. <laughs> but but yeah, that took months of research. And um, and I was helped by this amazing professor at uh, London University. Uh, so so I, really, I really studied hard. But um, to go back to Junko, on my research, I then found that the samurai used to learn this instrument called the Satsuma Biwa, the Biwa. And they used to sing tales of their exploits on this instrument. And so it was so appropriate and, and, and in many ways the most warlike of instruments, not exactly because of the way it sounds, but, but because of what the samurai used to play it. And it used to be part of their training to learn it. And, and actually I do think it's quite warlike because it comes with this huge plectrum, which is like the size of a sort of fan, um, and and you whack it, and you do pick slides with it. <laughs> Seriously, you, know, you look it up. You do That's... pick slides. You do, and you hit the strings really hard, and it makes this huge twanging sound. It's amazing. And um, there's a very famous uh, uh, piece of music called the Atsumore, which is the story of the high cave, which is one of the classic Japanese tales that everyone learns in in school. And this woman Junko. She played that for, for me. And I'm missing an important part of the story, actually. As the tradition of samurai fell away in Japan, yeah. the, the, the art of playing this instrument began to disappear. And, and I may oh. be romanticizing a bit, but, but this is how I understand it. There was one great master of this instrument left who taught a few people. And one of those students is Junko Ueda. And she's now herself a great master of this instrument. And, uh, and she, she lives in Spain, and so fortunately wasn't too far from where, London. And she, we flew her over and she came here and she played for me and she taught me about this instrument. And she played this incredible piece of music of the story of the haike. And that is also in, in, the, uh, in the score on the track, The Way of the Jita. That is literally just this ancient, ancient, piece of music 800 years old um and it opens with that and, and i use the instrument throughout the score in my own way as well but i just love that i that 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 i was able to explore these uh these uh ancient uh japanese musical worlds and that and that sucker punch and sony playstation were with me the whole way agreeing with my uncompromising approach of let's just use this let's not change it 
This is yeah. the real thing. Let's embrace it. And um, and and I think a lot of the power of the school comes from that uncompromising artistic approach. Wow, that's awesome. And the soundtrack was a collaboration, right? With, um, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Shigeru Umabayashi. How were you given the division of workload, for example? Like, how was it presented to you? Was it straight from the off that, like, okay, you're doing this, you're doing that, this is how it's going to work? Or did you have to kind of figure out how to do it yourselves? Uh, I'm going to call him Ume because that, that's what that's uh, that's what that's how we that's what we call him. Uh, of course, yeah, and, and what he calls himself. So Ume, you know, the funny thing is that I collaborated with Ume many years ago uh, on on Hannibal Rising. Uh, oh, okay. And and so I was delighted to work with him again, and I was very open to the collaboration. But sucker punch. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny how those, uh, that's not why they asked us to collaborate. It was just a complete coincidence. The thing is, is that Sucker Punch, I, I was very happy to collaborate very closely with Ume. He's a, a very, he's a great master and a, a, a really wonderful composer. And I have a lot of admiration for him. But, uh, but Sucker Punch and PlayStation had other ideas. They really wanted Ume to focus on a specific area of the game. Um, and they wanted me to focus on, on other areas. And so our work didn't cross over at all. And, um, and in fact, we, we worked with some of the same musicians and shared some studio time, but really our, our only collaboration was over a very memorable sushi dinner in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and a large bottle of sake. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, but I, love it. I honestly, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to to share a credit with with Ume again. Yeah, and I always love it when composers collaborate because to me, it's kind of on paper it makes sense, but then in terms of how it actually works workflow wise, it sometimes baffles me because it's always done differently, right? So sometimes it's like, okay, you have levels, you have cutscenes, you have exploration, you have combat. You know, like it's sometimes very modular and other times it's like, okay, well, you're going to sort of both work on this track as well as like these things. And, you know, so I'm always curious how it's going to work. Yeah, totally. The, the only thing that I, yeah, I, I love collaborations in my, you know, my career is littered with them. And I also do a lot of collaborative songwriting with pop artists and stuff. And the one thing that I, that I object to that I wouldn't do is where somebody gets you to both do something. You work on this and you also work on this and then I'll choose because that, mm. that is not positive collaboration. No, that's, that's competitive, competitive collaboration. Yeah, exactly. That's not and I'm really constructive. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I really don't like that. And you know, sometimes I worry that the, the industry can, can lean towards the competitive sometimes in, in certain areas and I just think that, you know, people pitching for stuff and demoing for stuff and perhaps a necessary evil at certain points in people's careers. But, but you know, I just think it's not, it's not about, we don't make art through competition. It's not, it's not art. Music isn't a sport, you know, it's, 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 you work hard at it and you collaborate with, with, you know, other musicians or with your other creative people that you're working with and, and then you get to where you're going. Yeah, and the whole soundtrack. How many how many tracks and hours overall would you say there is? I wrote twice as much music as there is in the game uh, because you know lots of things you write don't stick, right? You you have to explore lots of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I wrote you know, over a hundred minutes of music. Uh, 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 wow. that, that's in in the game, but there's. Um, you know, I don't know how much I wrote in total. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, music that that is unused, but that's true of all my projects. You know, because it, it's I, I don't know. Sometimes I think people feel like, oh, you got to use everything, or that you're going going to get everything right first time. It's not. It's an exploration. It's and also I just think you know, like a, you think a, think a band just when they put out an album of ten songs, you think that they just wrote those ten songs in. They wrote twenty, thirty songs, and they whittled it down to the ten best. Yeah, of course. So that's, so that's the like, same process, you know. Yeah, definitely. This next question I have is actually submitted from Sergio on our Game Audio Nexus Discord server. So it's a submitted question, this one. Um, he asks, did you ever make a conscious effort to pay homage to Fumio Hayasaki, 
the original composer of The Seven Samurai with the score, like redeveloping any themes or sound palettes to follow the Akira Kurosawa theme? No, I I mean, I really, I, I, I'm a big fan of Kurosawa as much as a, a, anybody else. Um, but I decided, that although the game definitely pays some homage to him, musically, I did not want to go down that road at all because, you know, it was a different time and, and that music is great in its own context, but it's very, I mean, it's kind of very Western and symphonic and that's not really what we wanted to do. It's got a real old Hollywood movie scale to it. And some of the way that it does use Japanese instruments and or themes is, I think, by modern standards, might almost be seen as sort of culturally appropriating something or not treating it with the right amount of respect because I really tried not to westernize the Japanese music, that for me, that the use of the orchestra in this score was as a sort of, as an accompaniment to, to, to the Japanese instruments. And it was very difficult because even if you look at Takemitsu, you know, the, the great Japanese composer who combined uh, uh, Japanese instruments and uh, the, the Western Symphonic Orchestra, he he said that there he said there is no real way to combine these these instruments and if you listen to to his music typically what will happen is you'll get some symphonic stuff and then you'll get some japanese instruments and then answered by some more symphonic stuff they they don't tend to overlap um, and and the way that he writes for the for the for the Japanese instruments is all, often sort of aleatoric, you know, just with lines and you know in, in impressionistic writing. So I refused to believe that there wasn't a way to combine it. And what I decided to do was I thought I'm going to write in the Japanese harmonic language. So all the melodies are written. Let's take the, 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 the main theme, the way of the ghost. That's written, it uses the in scale, Japanese in scale, it's a five note pentatonic scale. In that piece of music, there is only five notes. That's it. And and the way that I did it was, was I, it, it sat perfectly for the koto, it sat great for the shakuhachi um, and the shinobue, uh, no problems. And then the orchestra plays those melodies because I wanted to write melodies that would sit naturally for the instruments, but then the orchestra plays the melody and uh, it's, it's also cello play, playing as well in a, in a sort of ethnic uh, style. Um, but, but the orchestra then plays those melodies and then I had the problem of, of how am I going to harmonise this? Because there isn't really a system of chords in uh, Japanese feudal music. And so I decided to devise a system of chords built out of the pentatonic scales. And, and that's what I did. And I, I devised this system and I used it across the score. And so in the way of the ghost, all the harmony, all the chords are just stacked up like different notes pulled out and stacked out of the, out of the pentatonic scale. And so there is, again, just purity of, of, of idea in that. You, you, that piece of music could be performed with only Japanese instruments, every single note of it. Um, and so that way, I made the, the symphonic orchestra fit into the mould, into the architecture of uh, Japanese uh, harmony, melody. So rather than trying to bring... Japanese music into a Western harmonic framework, I did exactly the opposite. I said I'm sticking with the Japanese melodic harmonic rhythmic framework and I'm going yeah. to just use these bits of, of Western stuff, uh, Western instruments and music uh, to fit in with that. 
Then, of course, occasionally you break the rules because that's what rules are there for. They're there to be broken. And, oh, and when you do break the rules <laughs> and you suddenly have... Because, you know, in, in the way of the ghost, there's no key change because, because, because the, you know, the, the Shakuhachi and the Koto can't change key halfway through, right? Because they're not, they're not chromatic. So there's no key change. But then later on, you know, I did, a lot of the pieces are like that. But then later on, in some places, you do suddenly have a key change. And that is really powerful because you've withheld from doing it. for Yeah, because you kind of built up to it by not doing it for so long. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, in other places where I really, in, in some of the combats, it felt like you needed a key change. But it would, the only root notes would be the the tonic uh the dominant and the subdominant because one five and four are are part of every pentatonic scale part of every single scale on on, on the planet so so um so it, it would only be very very related keys wow that's super cool so you've kind of highlighted a lot of elements of the score that you're working on um what would you say is your proudest moment I think it's the purity of concept uh, that that runs through the score, which is embracing the the instruments, using them in their natural way, using pieces of music in their complete original form, and and, and developing from there using the scales in the way that I talk to. You know, as I'm talking about it, it might sound obvious, but it is actually, it's very restrictive, the challenge to write, but it also requires your collaborators, in this case, PlayStation and Soccer Punch, to believe in it and yeah. to go on the journey with you. And there's so much trust as well. Yeah, and, I, and I'm incredibly grateful to them. Because, you know, because it's a risk, right? I mean, imagine, imagine like, you know, go walking in, walking into a, a meeting and saying, and saying, okay, listen, I've got a great idea uh, for, for, for the score for your whatever it is I'm doing. Um, normally, when we write, we write with 12 notes, but I'm actually only going to write with five notes. And I'm only going to do this and I'm only going to do that and, and I'm not going to do anything else. That sounds pretty scary, right? And so, yeah, yeah and, it's pretty intense, right? You know, and so, and so, I am grateful and a lot of credit to those guys for not trying to water down the idea. And so that's that's what I'm most proud of is that I was able to deliver within the confines of this idea something that they loved and and that you know clearly you know, the gaming community and, and, and the world are, are, are engaging with and connecting to. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad it worked out, basically. Yeah, well, it's gone down very well. So I'd say it worked out rather nicely. <laughs> yeah, because it's also, it's, it is, for me, it's terrifying as well, right? You, you know, to, to come up with, with a, a, a crazy idea, you know, it's like, because, because you go, hey, let's do this thing and uh, it's going to be great. But like, I don't know it's going to be great, right? I'm just saying it's going to be great. Yeah, I'm just telling them it's going to be great, and then I have to deliver. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's going to be terrible. I have no idea, right? So, so, so you, it, it takes a tremendous amount of energy and self belief to to you know bring people on that journey with you as well. It's it's a, yeah, it's a real course. challenge. So, where do you draw your inspiration from, and what what would you say influences your creative process? Well, for me, in this project, all, all the things we've talked about, the instruments and the, the harmonic language, the, the, that's really where my uh, inspiration was from. But I, I think we've talked about it in, a, in, in quite a, a technical way so far. And, and I don't, when I'm writing it, I, of course, I don't think of it like that. I don't think of it in an analytical, hey, this is the subdominant and this is the, the pedal. And, you know, I, I, I don't think of it in that way at all um and in fact i'm always trying to remove any sort of knowledge of any kind of theory or musicality and just listen for 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 what 
sounds good. But I, what I like often is to have a set of rules. So having the right. five note scale, that's quite useful, right? Because it's like, well, I have to write something. You know, the blank canvas is terrifying. You sit down in front of your 88 black and white notes, which are the same 88 black and white notes that Tchaikovsky and Wagner sat in front of. And you think, hmm, how do you start with that? That's terrifying. But, you know, but if you've got an idea to hang off, then you can say, well, it's got to be within this. And so that yeah. at least that's something to push against. That's a, you know, I like this idea that there's there's no art without resistance from the medium, and you can define what what your medium is. For for an artist, it might be well, I'm only going to paint. You know, for Eves Klein, it was like I'm only going to paint in blue, right? So so you know what whatever that is. So so that's how I use that insp- inspiration. But then but then you get to that bit where the, you know on every project where you've just got to you've got to write a tune. And, and, and that's, you know, there's elements of, of, of the job that are, that are craft based, right? Where, where, you know, one, once you've written Luke Skywalker's theme, then you need to fit it into the film. Fitting it into yeah. the film, that's the craft bit, right? Anyone can learn to do that. Not anyone can write a, a great theme. And so that, for me, that's the hardest bit. And, I, and I just try, like everyone, you know, I try to get, get in the zone. I just try to get something done you know just just write something because there's nothing worse than going to bed and not having done anything even if what you've done yeah. is rubbish uh you can always improve it the next day that's what i think yeah i mean to be honest i take the same approach it's like even when i was back at uni and writing assignments i was like just write any old garbage and then we can tidy it up later you know just write something so you know what not to have and maybe what to have like, <laughs> that's it so spend you know what I mean you spend your whole life aiming low <laughs> yeah, exactly just get something done right so yeah so, so I, I, I think that's really helpful but I am fascinated because there's you know you there's a point at which the notes are just random right and why are some notes random and the other notes a melody you know why is if i do a scribble on a piece of paper it's just a scribble but if some great artist did a scribble on a piece of paper it's a, it's a work of art and and i think the the thing is is that and this is always what i'm looking for as i'm sort of playing around with the melodies is there's a moment or, or playing around with the notes trying to find the melody there's a moment where the notes come together and they're not just a group of notes anymore they they suddenly they have meaning. They they yeah. make you feel something, and it, in that moment, it's the, the, those notes are greater than the sum of their parts. They're not just notes anymore. They they've got something, and I think that's true yeah. of all art. And that's the moment. That's the thing that I'm looking for. The the the, the really sort of philosophical question here, though, is 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 that group of notes that has meaning? Did that always exist in the ether somewhere, or did I breathe life into it? And I don't know the answer. <laughs> I puzzle over that one. Um, but it's one of those, um, you know, that one of those big questions, basically, that doesn't really have an answer, but you can blow your mind just thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. And and for me, that's that's the you know that's the creative that that that's the place of my creativity. You know, again, I've sort of I've analysed it in quite uh, quite an intellectual way there, I suppose. But 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 I'm just trying to describe it. But but it's but that's my sort of world of sort of creative flow. That's you know full of sort of anxiety and joy and misery and <laughs> and all, all the things that I think all creative people go through. Yeah, definitely. And kind of my one of the well, can be the trickiest questions that I ask people on the show is if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I would tell myself to slow down because I was so had such strong will towards my career. I was so I pushed myself so hard towards that that I worked all through my early 20s when a lot of my friends went travelling around the world working in bars and and having a blast and and I didn't do that at that time and I, and I, you know and if I'd just slowed down and taken that couple of years out it wouldn't have really made a I don't think it would have made a particularly big difference to to where I am now I, I mean who knows because there's luck and opportunity and all those things maybe my life would have been completely different but but um but 
yeah, I would, I would, I would tell myself in my twenties to slow down and enjoy myself a little bit more. I think I would actually concur with that. Um, not that like, you know, I'm not saying we're old or anything, but as you age, you definitely look back and go, man, I wish I'd just stopped and enjoyed what was going on a bit more rather than focusing on like having to do all this and having to like power through, you know? Yeah. Okay. So my last question for you, this is, <laughs> it usually can be a very short answer. <laughs> what other projects are you working on at the moment that you can tell us about? Oh, I'm, I've got I've got a long answer for you because I'm really oh, excited fantastic. to talk about talk about. <laughs> well, and, you know, I've got there's two things. Um, one is um, right now I'm just finishing writing the next David Attenborough series called A Perfect Planet. Um, it's my third project with with Attenborough. Awesome. And, and I just think it's a really it's a really important and powerful. Uh, series and I'm really proud to to be a part of it. Um, you know, I've approached it in in my own <laughs> uncompromising way. Uh, you know, as we, as we talked about before, I, I went when I met with the with the guys about doing it. I told them, look, I want to approach it in this way. I don't want to do the traditional, uh, uh, you know, natural history thing. Um, and if you're okay with that, then then let's do it. And they were up for it, and they've awesome. once again really trusted in my process. And uh, so I'm really really excited about the music I'm writing. And I'm literally in the right now in the middle of finishing up the the last episode. Um, so uh, so that's uh, nice. so that's very exciting. And just really proud to be collaborating with uh, David Attenborough again. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, and the other thing that I uh, uh, would love to talk about is my own uh, personal project, which is uh, called Space Station Earth. And um, it's a project about astronauts, the International Space Station, and the experience that they all share from leaving our planet and going to somewhere else and seeing our planet from oh, wow. that other place. And wow. um, it started because Tim Peake, the British astronaut, got in touch with me uh, just before he went to the space station because he was a fan of my music. I actually, a fan of Layer Cake originally, funnily enough, uh, to come bring this oh, conversation cool. <laughs> to a circle. And, um, and he said, it's a funny story. He said, look, you know, we make these videos when we go up onto the space station and I like your music and would you? And I said, yeah, I'd love to, of course. I mean, you know, who would say no to an astronaut? Um, he said, look, we don't have any money because we spend all our money on space travel. Um, is that okay? And I said, that's absolutely no problem. I'm happy to do it. Just can I come to the launch? Uh, he said, look, you can't. It's in Kazakhstan and the R R Russian, you know, the, the Russian Cosmodrome. It's, it's like a, it's a whole thing. Very hard to get to. At that time, there was only this Russian Soyuz going to the space station. So that was not really possible, but uh, but he said, "Look, I'm I'm training at, at uh, in Houston at Johnson NASA Johnson Space Center. Why don't you come visit me here?" So I went there, spent a couple of days getting the tour that you could never get, getting to go on the replica space station, trying on a spacesuit, you know, like the real deal. It was really, really mind blowing. A really hugely inspiring day. A fabulous dinner with Tim. And at the end of it, I just thought, why are we making a five, six minute film? Why don't we make like a whole big giant show? And, uh, and so that was years in the making. Um, and we performed the show. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's across three screens. So we performed it in Stockholm for, for 10,000 people this time last year. Uh, oh, cool. It, it was, you know, 35, 36 meters of screen across, with, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, you know, 
three synths and drums and uh, you know That's and epic. me on synth and guitars I got to play my Gibson Flying V which was a sort of childhood dream and the choir and the <laughs> choir and an orchestra in the background and it's just images and music and and it tries to just express that there's so much science out there about the about about traveling in space and about astronauts and about life on the international space station but there's nothing out there that expresses the emotional journey of it all and and that's what that's what i set out to do with this and um anyway we were we were meant to we were meant to be playing uh the blue dot festival in glastonbury this year and uh and we were meant to be going on tour um you know in the, in the next few weeks actually but of course all of that has been put on hold because of the pandemic uh, but we will yeah. be back and uh and and it's a project that i've created from you know from nothing and it's something i'm really proud of and really excited about um so uh so please uh look out for it awesome well i have to say it's been an absolute blast having you on the show and i hope you'll join us again in the near future great yeah thank you very much for, for having me on great chat everyone this is sam thanks very much for listening to the sound architect podcast today i hope you enjoyed this episode if so there are many ways you can support the show which is incredibly appreciated obviously there's the financial way where you can support us on patreon which is patreon.com forward slash sound design uk however there are many other ways which also help such as liking subscribing reviewing commenting and sharing via whatever channel you listen on Thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me, and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again, and catch you on the next episode.